Have you ever, you know, stopped to think if what we eat could really, truly impact conditions like autism spectrum disorder? I mean, there's so much dietary advice out there. It's overwhelming. How do you even begin to separate uh, the real science from maybe just wishful thinking, especially with something like neurodevelopment? Well, that's exactly what we're going to try and unpack in this deep dive. Today, we're focusing on autism spectrum disorder, ASD. It's, well, it's a complex neurodevelopmental condition. We know genetics play a role, but the environment does too. Our mission today is to explore that fascinating and sometimes pretty challenging relationship between nutrition and ASD. We've looked at uh, a lot of recent research, but also what families are actually experiencing day to day. We want to figure out what the science really says, what people are trying, and you know where the promising leads are for the future. The goal is to help you, our listener, get really well informed on this. And I think it's really important to say this right at the start. We're not talking about simple cures here. That's not the conversation. Instead, we're looking at a much more nuanced interaction, how diet might influence the risk, uh, maybe the expression of symptoms. We'll touch on everything from nutrition during pregnancy, specific nutrients, and even, surprisingly, the role of our gut. Okay, right. So let's kick things off with something where science seems, well, pretty consistent. Folate and folinic acid. Indeed. Yeah, this is a strong area. Multiple studies uh, quite consistently show that if moms get enough folate during pregnancy, it seems to act as a protective factor against autism risk for their child. It just it really highlights how crucial that prenatal window is and how maternal nutrition is just foundational for brain development. But it's not quite as simple as just take more folate, is it? There's a bit more to it than that. Yeah, that's a really key point. Yeah. Researchers have found what they call a U-shaped relationship. Think of it like... Um, watering a plant, maybe. Too little water, it struggles. Mm -hmm. But too much water isn't good either, right? It's similar with folate. Both very low levels and actually very high levels could potentially be problematic. It shows how delicate that balance is. Ah, okay. So balance is key. Exactly. Which is why, you know, personalized advice is so important, not just a blanket recommendation. And this folate story doesn't just end with pregnancy, does it? There's also work being done with folinic acid for kids who already have an ASD diagnosis. Yes, absolutely. Recent studies have shown some really encouraging results using folinic acid supplementation with children with ASD. They've reported improvements in things like verbal communication, uh, adaptive behaviors. And what's particularly interesting is that some kids seem to benefit even more, especially those with something called folate receptor autoantibodies. Folate receptor autoantibodies, what are those exactly? They're basically immune markers. If a child has them, it might mean their body has trouble utilizing folate properly. So for these kids, folinic acid supplementation might provide a bigger boost. It suggests a more tailored approach could be really beneficial for certain individuals. Okay, that makes sense. So from specific nutrients like folate, let's shift gears to something that's, well, it feels like it's everywhere in research right now, the gut-brain connection. It seems gastrointestinal or GI issues are way more common in kids with ASD. Oh, significantly more common, yes. That's a finding that pops up again and again in studies. And what makes it even more compelling is that some research suggests the severity of the GI problems might actually correlate with the severity of the autism symptoms. That points to a much deeper link than we maybe used to think. Wow. So if the gut is playing such a big role, what kinds of interventions are people looking at? What's showing promise? Well, probiotics are definitely a big one. There was a really solid study recently, 12 weeks, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, you know, the gold standard. And it found that the group getting probiotics had significantly more diverse gut bacteria afterwards, and importantly, a decrease in bacteria often linked to anxiety. That's a, that's a pretty strong signal from a well-designed study. Yeah, a study like that, double-blind, placebo-controlled, really carries some weight, doesn't it? Are other studies finding similar things? Yes, there are others. Some looked at probiotic drinks, found they were well tolerated, and suggested improvements in behavior, gut symptoms, even sleep. Now, some of these were maybe more preliminary, perhaps didn't have a control group. But a big meta-analysis in 2024 did pull together findings and showed overall small but positive effects on behavior. Interestingly, it suggested multi-strain probiotics might be a bit more effective, though it's important to note they didn't seem to directly fix the core social symptoms of autism. Okay. And what about prebiotics? I know they're different from probiotics, but often mentioned alongside them. Right. Good distinction. Probiotics are the actual live beneficial bacteria. 
Prebiotics are more like the food for those good bacteria, think certain types of fiber. And yes, there are studies there too. Some show modest improvements in social behaviors when prebiotics help shift the gut bacteria populations towards a healthier profile. It's all part of fostering a better internal ecosystem, really. This next bit feels... I don't know, almost futuristic. The idea that the gut could directly impact brain function and behavior yeah. in this way is just mm -hmm. huge. Tell us about fecal microbiota transplantation, FMT. Sounds uh, pretty intense. It does sound intense. And well, it is quite an intervention. But the results from early studies are genuinely compelling. One significant study showed that kids with ASD who received FMT had substantial improvements, not just in their gut symptoms, but also in their autism-related behaviors. And fascinatingly, their gut bacteria composition actually shifted to look more like that of the neurotypical control group. Their gut environment started to resemble one without ASD. And what really strengthens the case is the animal model research. Studies where gut microbes from children with ASD were transferred to mice actually caused those mice to show ASD-like behaviors. That provides pretty strong backing for the idea that the gut isn't just correlated, it might play a causal role. That is mind-bending, yeah. a direct causal link like that. But surely with something like FMT, there have to be big caveats. Oh, absolutely. Huge caveats. FMT for ASD is very much in the early research phase. We need a lot more data, especially on long-term safety, before anyone could even think about it as a standard clinical approach. Yeah. We're watching and learning and definitely not recommending it broadly yet. Okay, understood. So moving on from the gut, let's look at some other vitamins and minerals. Here, the signals seem a bit more, let's say, mixed, starting with vitamin D. Yes, vitamin D is interesting. We know deficiency is quite common in children with ASD, and it has been linked to behavioral difficulties. But when you look at studies where they actually give vitamin D supplements, the results are, well, inconsistent. Some report slight improvements in things like irritability or hyperactivity, but others don't find the same thing. It's not a clear-cut picture for all symptoms. So not a simple fix for everything. Not consistently, no. Although what is interesting is a meta-analysis from 2023. It specifically looked at different symptom types and found a statistically significant reduction just in repetitive behaviors with vitamin D supplementation. Oh, okay. So maybe targeted effects. Potentially. It suggests vitamin D might influence certain aspects of behavior more than others, rather than being a broad solution for all core symptoms. It's complex. And what about minerals like zinc and copper? You hear about those for general health, too. Right. Recent studies have found correlations. Children with ASD sometimes show higher copper levels and lower zinc to copper ratios. And this sometimes links up with symptom severity. But, and this is crucial, these are correlations. They point towards a potential biological difference, maybe something to investigate further, but they don't automatically mean that supplementing zinc or reducing copper is a proven treatment. We're not there yet. Got it. Correlation isn't causation. And other mi micronutrients, B12, magnesium, those, those names come up a lot too. They do. And again, we see correlational studies linking lower levels of B12 or magnesium to certain ASD traits or maybe symptom severity. But, and it's a significant but, the direct high quality evidence showing that supplementing with these specific nutrients leads to clear, consistent improvements in core ASD symptoms. That's still largely missing for many of them. So the takeaway isn't just to, you know, throw a bunch of supplements at the issue and hope for the best. Exactly not. In fact, one study pointed out something important. Even though many families use supplements, deficiencies can still hang around. And sometimes kids might actually get too much of certain things like vitamin A or zinc. It just really hammers home the need for personalized assessment and guidance from healthcare professionals, not just randomly trying things. Every child's biochemistry is different. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Let's pivot now to some specific dietary approaches that generate a lot of conversation. Omega-3s, the gluten-free, casein-free diet, and the ketogenic diet. Let's start with omega-3s, fish oils, DHA, EPA, often touted for brain health. Yes, and their role in general brain development is pretty solid science. But when we look specifically at using them as an intervention for ASD, the research is, frankly, quite mixed. Some studies might hint at benefits for things like thinking skills, memory, maybe attention. A few small trials suggested mild improvements in communication. But then you have other, sometimes larger studies that found no consistent effect on the core symptoms of autism. Often when researchers review all the evidence together, they rate the quality as low or very low, meaning we just don't have enough strong, reliable studies yet to say definitively, yes, this works for ASD. Mm, okay. What about the gluten-free, casein-free diet, the GFCF diet? That one seems incredibly popular, especially in parent circles. 
It absolutely is. And there are some potentially promising signs. A 2022 meta-analysis did suggest it might help reduce repetitive behaviors and maybe improve cognitive skills, especially in kids who also have noticeable gut problems. But it's definitely a nuanced picture. Other controlled studies haven't found a significant impact on social skills or communication. And crucially, you have to be careful. If it's not managed properly, a GFCF diet can lead to nutritional deficiencies, weight loss, even sleep issues, particularly tricky for kids who are already selective eaters. Right. Potential risks to consider there. Yeah. And the ketogenic diet. We often hear about that for epilepsy. Any relevance for ASD? There's some interest, yes. A few small studies, and that 2022 meta-analysis again, suggested possible cognitive and behavioral benefits in some children with ASD, maybe even for core symptoms. But the key word is some. The data is really limited. We don't know much about long-term effects or safety in this context. And honestly, the diet itself is very restrictive and can be really hard to stick to. Plus, it can have side effects. This really brings us to a critical point, doesn't it? When the science is still developing, when it's mixed like this, how do families actually cope how do they make decisions? What are they actually doing and seeing in the real world? Exactly. And that's where looking beyond just the formal studies becomes so valuable. These real world experiences, the anecdotal reports from parents. They might not be controlled trials, but they offer incredibly important insights. They show us what families are trying, what they think is working, and often highlight that gap between the pace of research and the urgent needs of daily life with ASD. Yeah, the science is clearly complex. It's still moving. So what does this mean on the ground? We looked into parent blogs, online forums, places where families share experiences. What's coming through there? One thing that seems almost universal is this focus on avoiding sugar and artificial additives. Oh, definitely. You see that everywhere. Yeah. There's a very strong belief among many, many parents that things like refined sugar, high fructose corn syrup, artificial colors, preservatives, that these negatively affect their kids' behavior. They talk about increased hyperactivity, difficulty focusing. And then they share stories, often very positive stories, about seeing calmer behavior, better concentration, fewer meltdowns, less impulsivity when they cut these things out. It's why specific approaches like the Fangold diet, which targets those additives, have stayed popular for so long. Parents often feel they see a direct, tangible benefit. And that GSCF diet we discussed scientifically is a huge topic in parent communities too, isn't it? Massive. You find countless accounts from parents who feel they saw really positive changes after going GFCF. They talk about better eye contact, uh, improvements in language, sometimes better sleep, and very often more subtle digestion. There's this powerful phrase you sometimes see. It's like a fog lifted. Parents often directly link the diet to easing chronic gut problems like constipation or diarrhea, which they feel reduces tantrums and makes their child generally more comfortable and happier. But it doesn't work for everyone. No, and parents acknowledge that too. Not everyone sees dramatic changes, but the sentiment is often that it's worth trying, maybe for a few months, just to see if it makes a difference for their particular child. Okay. And building on that digestion theme, there seems to be a big focus on gut health more broadly with fermented foods and probiotics getting a lot of attention. Yes, the whole gut health conversation is definitely booming in parent communities. You see parents actively trying to incorporate homemade fermented foods, things like yogurt, kefir, sauerkraut, pickles, even kimchi or kombucha. And they share stories about seeing improvements, less gas, less constipation or diarrhea. And they often link this improved gut comfort to their child being calmer, sleeping better, and sometimes they even feel it helps with speech or attention. And commercial probiotics, too. Yep. Those are very commonly used as well. Parents report similar kinds of benefits, better gut comfort, which then seems to have knock-on positive effects on behavior. The advice you often see shared is to start slowly, small amounts because of taste or maybe some initial digestive adjustments. Alongside specific diets, there's also this push towards organic and natural foods, kind of reducing overall chemical exposure. Right. It reflects a real concern about quality and potential environmental impacts. Many parents make a conscious effort to choose organic, hormone-free, pesticide-free options when they can. They worry about chemicals potentially affecting a developing nervous system. You hear specific concerns about things like glyphosate or GMOs and the reported benefits. Parents sometimes mention observing fewer skin allergies, maybe more stable moods or energy levels, better focus when they make that switch to cleaner, less processed foods. Some even use food sensitivity testing to pinpoint specific foods and then find organic alternatives. Okay, and finally, let's touch on nutritional supplements again, but from that parent perspective, how widespread is their use? 
It seems very widespread. Some estimates suggest, you know, maybe 75% or even more children with ASD use at least one supplement. Often it's driven by worries about picky eating or just wanting to cover all the nutritional bases. Omega-3s, fish oil are incredibly popular. Parents often hope for better focus, maybe breakthroughs in language, reduced hyperactivity. It's often seen as a low risk, might help kind of strategy. And multivitamins. Very common, yeah. Seen as nutritional insurance, especially for those picky eaters. Vitamin D gets mentioned a lot, particularly if tests show low levels, with parents hoping for better immunity or mood. You also still hear about B6 and magnesium, sometimes linked to calmness or sleep, maybe small gains in speech. Zinc and iron come up if there are deficiencies potentially linked to appetite or attention, and some parents trying folate, specifically folinic acid, report observing an increased desire to communicate. So it's quite a range. Do parents always see effects? Not always, and they often say that. Some notice clear changes, others see variable effects, and some see none at all. But that proactive approach, wanting to ensure their child gets essential nutrients, seems very common. Look, wow, that's a lot to take in, from the hard science to the lived experiences. So pulling it all together, what are the really big takeaways from this deep dive? I think the clearest message is that nutrition is a significant factor. It's not a cure-all, absolutely not, but it's a really important, modifiable piece of the puzzle for supportive care in ASD. And we see some really interesting points where the science and the parental observations seem to align quite well. The importance of maternal folate, for instance, the need to check for and address specific deficiencies like vitamin D, both research and parents point to that, and definitely the gut-brain axis. The science is getting stronger there, and parents have been focused on gut health, probiotics, and diet for a long time. That convergence is really compelling. And the need for personalization seems to echo through everything, doesn't it? Absolutely. That's probably the single most important practical takeaway. Both the research community and experienced parents emphasize that nutritional strategies have to be individualized. What works for one child might not work for another. And critically, any significant dietary change or supplementation plan really needs to be clinically monitored by healthcare professionals to make sure the child is getting adequate nutrition overall, to avoid potential risks, and to see these things as supportive measures alongside established therapies, not replacements. So while there are definitely promising avenues, that call for more high-quality research is still really strong. Oh, absolutely. We've learned a lot. But for many of these interventions, GFCF, keto, even some supplements, we still need more large, well-controlled human studies to give us truly definitive answers. We need to bridge that gap between hopeful observations and solid clinical recommendations that apply broadly. Right. But hopefully, exploring all this gives you, our listener, a much better handle on the landscape. It empowers you to understand the complexities, ask better questions, and, you know, make more informed decisions. And maybe a final thought to leave you with. As we keep learning more about this incredible dance between our diet and our brains, just how much of our overall well-being truly starts on our plate, not just for those with ASD, but really for all of us. And thinking specifically about that gut-brain connection, how might future discoveries really reshape our whole approach to supporting neurodevelopment? Could we move towards a more holistic, personalized nutritional paradigm, perhaps less reliant solely on medication. It's certainly something to keep thinking about.